Hey everybody, live at Drew's house, another edition, Joppa Afternoon Drive. Hope you're all doing well. Obviously back in my uh, my kitchen today, so literally live at Drew's house. Uh, we have a, some COVID issues in the house, so it is. this is what's not going away. It is still a pandemic and uh, just another reminder for me, but uh, we'll be back in the studio next week, uh, hopefully just a, a week from home for me here. And I get to be joined by a uh, familiar face, a uh, friend of the show here, Bruce Men in Newburyport School Committee. Hey Bruce, how are you? Good, Drew. How are you? Good, good. We were uh, we just talked off the uh, off the air. Sarah Blackstone, our producer here today, very impressed by your plants. I tried to add a few myself just to keep up. No, I'm a lucky guy. I, they seem to thrive. <laughs> very good. Well, obviously, we we talked during a tough week here because uh, we can't start any show talking about uh, schools without the horrible shooting in Valdi, Texas. Um, we keep learning more about it as we go, but, uh, but I mean, we, we know enough at this point, uh, another school shooting, another mass shooting in schools and just, uh, initial take when you heard this. Sure. Well, you know, heart sick, um, about it. Um, obviously you, you hate to hear these things happening and you hate the fact that they continue to happen. And, um, and we choose to really not address the issues uh, head on, I think, in a lot of ways. So certainly our, our thoughts and prayers go out to, uh, to the folks uh, in, in Texas. Um, I mean, wor worth noting that when, I, I mean, this was particularly horrific um, and, uh, and I'm happy to talk about it. I do, I do wanna just sort of offer the disclaimer or the caveat that any opinions I express are my own, I'm not speaking on behalf of the school committee. But uh, but I certainly have opinions about this. But it's it's just tragic, and uh, and we we don't seem to be taking the very simple steps that may mitigate some of these uh, attacks. That's fair enough. Um, you know, we I, I talk. I don't have kids in the schools, right? I don't have kids, so I don't have kids in the school system. I'm kind of in that age group that you might think is a little bit uh, removed from it. And I think for people that maybe don't have kids in schools, they kind of wonder. I wonder if this resonates. I wonder what's going on in the classrooms across the country. Um, I talked to teachers in Rockport yesterday, I talked to another uh, teacher in Ipswich, and I've talked to a few teachers in Newburyport, and they all said to me, oh, if you think kids don't have questions at every grade level, you are crazy. I mean, this is the first thing. They want to know what teachers think. This is the talk in the classrooms all week. Well, you know, as, as horrific as it is, you know, when they finally were able to get into the school, um, the the adults' bodies, they discovered the bodies of the teachers across the students trying to protect the students. Mm. So, you know, I, I'm, it, it is, the kids see this, they know this. Um, it, it's funny because over the last uh, six months, you've seen the term social emotional learning sort of percolate up um, from folks and they're really worried about the social emotional learning. And really what social emotional learning is, is making sure that everybody feels welcome and safe at school. That's really what social emotional learning is. So, um, so you know, you, you you train teachers so that they're more aware of kids that are going into crisis. You, you train students so they understand how to deal with conflict. That's what social emotional learning is. And yet, you know, we're still fighting this 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 battle with some members of the community about that. You know, those are the tools that we need to keep people safe, to keep kids safe. Um, and you know, it's it's very very frustrating. And listen, I mean, we come from a, th this is an area of the world, where, you know, North Shore, Newburyport. I, you know, I went to high school in Danvers uh, where, you know, you think this is not going to happen here. You know, it's their communities where everybody knows everybody. It doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's going to happen here. You know, I graduated a few years later, there were, you know, there was a murder at Danvers High School. I mean, I'm not trying to go all doom and gloom here, but it can happen in your community. Right. And I think right. people need to, this is not a, a one community issue. This is a, this is clearly a national issue at this point. It, it's a national issue, and we don't seem to have the will to deal with it as a national, you know, a national issue. I mean, you know, think about this. I, it, you know, sort of the suggestions that we're hearing in the immediate aftermath of this is, well, we need to harden the schools. We need to arm the teachers, you know, and, you know, and we, we just went through this whole pandemic and are worried about kids getting readjusted to schools. Imagine the readjustment of having an armed teacher packing a gun that you can see while they're teaching you. That just, it doesn't make any sense. There are some commonalities to what things are happening here. First off, one of the commonalities is, you know, the idea of arming teachers is kind of not a really good idea. 
You know, that's, you're not paying them to be armed guards. Um, it also has a real deleterious effect, I think, in the classroom. Um, but keep in mind that in Buffalo, there was an armed guard there who was taken out. So he was on the property. He had his guns. I understand from what I've read that in Uvalde, there were three armed uh, officers of the law there who weren't able to stop him from getting into the school. So the, that's, you know, that's sort of this fantasy of, 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 of how are we going to deal with it? And, you know, you look at how, how is somebody able, how are these kids, these damaged kids, able to kill 19, 15, 18 people? Why? Because they're using assault weapons. It's, it's, it's really, really simple. You, you want to minimize some of this? Let's deal with assault weapons. You don't hunt with them. The only reason that I've ever heard anybody give me for owning an assault rifle is that they feel that someday there may be a revolution in this country and they need to be armed. You don't hunt with them. You don't, you, you, you just don't need to do that. And for an 18 year old kid on his 18 year old, on his birthday, this kid was able to get assault weapons and enough ammunition to, to, to kill 19 people, maybe 19, maybe even more. So, you know, it's, it's, it's assault weapons just, what, why aren't we just banning them? You know? It's fascinating too, you know, when these things happen, it does, I mean, we all know, it's no secret at this point, why the conversation, why people tend not to attack guns, right? I mean, there's, there's certain interest and, in, you know, we can, we could get into that and whole, have a whole nother show on the politics behind it and the money behind it. Um, but it does seem fascinating to me that, you know, when these things happen a lot, you know, well, the back door was unlocked. That was the issue here. Or, you know, the, there were no armed guards. I mean, it's like, okay, is that really the issue for all these? I mean, I'm looking at a list of all the shootings right right now. I mean, I, you, I don't even remember a lot of them because there's so many. It's like, they, oh, I forgot about that, you know? We've had more mass shootings than we've had days in the year so far this year. Yeah. You know, across the United States. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean, those are those are the kind of suggestions that that people will will throw out there. I understand that Senator Cruz uh, gave a speech yesterday and he said the way that we can prevent this is there should be only one way into school and one way out of school. Obviously, Senator Cruz is somebody who's never heard of fire codes and multiple needs, multiple exits for emergencies. They're just spinning their wheels, trying to throw stuff out there when when really we could begin to deal with this as a mature nation. Switzerland. Switzerland is one of the most armed countries in the world. They give guns to people at 18, but they also train the heck out of them. They also make it really clear that if you have addiction issues or mental health issues, you can't get it. Those are really simple. You know, there, there aren't mass shootings in Switzerland and almost everybody's got a gun there. So it, it can be managed if you, you know, if you shut down the door, these aren't, you know, maybe these kids are really disturbed. And I certainly, you know, I mean, I spent, I spent, um, I spent five years as an emergency mental health outreach worker. And based on my own personal experience of five years of doing that uh, out in the community, my belief is that people who are mentally ill are far more likely to hurt themselves than they are to hurt other people. And that's based on literally 1400 visits to people out in the community. So it isn't, it, it isn't mental illness, but if it is mental illness, why aren't we supporting schools, uh, you know, to, in their in their efforts to do social emotional learning, to teach kids how to deal with stress, to teach kids how to talk about issues? Um, that in, in every school district, this stuff is splashed all over the news, and and these kids are asking questions, and they're they're kids. They're asking questions like, why are there so many guns? Why are there assault weapons? You know. I mean, I, I grew up, I'm, I'm older than you, Drew, and I grew up with duck and cover. And we, we, we rehearsed for nuclear bombs in the early 60s. Um, we, are, we have kids now who are rehearsing what to do if somebody enters their school with an assault weapon, with an assault weapon. So, you know, we can do better. We really I read, a, I read a father on Twitter from a, um, a different, just a random dad that made headlines and he was retweeted, you know, probably a million times at this point. But um, he said, I just had to have a talk with my daughter who's that age, fourth grade or whatever. And uh, she said, oh, don't worry, dad, we train for this. Uh, but the problem is all the good hiding spots are gone in the classroom. And for some reason, that tweet just gave me chills. Like if you don't get to the hiding spot quickly, you're in a rough spot. Like that's, 
that's what's going on in these classrooms now. Right. And, and, you know, and again, why are we letting this happen? You know, Senator Chris Murphy asked that question on the floor of the Senate. Why are we doing this? Why aren't we doing what we can do? You know, it doesn't impact anybody's ability to own a gun, to have to wait 10 days while, while, while their background checks being done. It doesn't impact anybody's ability to own a gun to ban weapons of mass destruction. It, that doesn't affect anybody's ability to own a gun. Just you don't need to own a gun that has a magazine with 100 bullets in it. Mm -hmm. You know, Chris Murphy, I would say, was one of the headline makers this week with his speech. I, Steve Kerr made a lot of the Golden State head coach made headlines. Uh, uh, Barack Obama said every day we wait on this is too late. Um, a lot of things that jump out to you. Beto O'Rourke interrupted the governor of Texas's uh, press conference yesterday, um, which is all, you know, it's all there. That's all the news right now. And it does feel like this time is different. But I have said that about several of these at this point mass shootings. And it, it feels like everybody in the country is enraged. And yes, something has to be done and is pressuring Congress and is pressuring their local officials. But when, when that, that news cycle is a funky thing, and I mean, maybe it's not different. It, it's, it's, what do you, what can you say about that? I mean, it, it does seem like we don't act when these things happen. We don't, you know, it, 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 each one of the, I mean, what, what does it take? Is it, is, is the, is the, the line that we're going to do something 15 kids and three teachers? Is it 20 kids? Is it 30 kids? What, what, what is going to cause us to really act? And, and again, um, you know, the, this is a really challenging time um, in, in our nation's history. We have lost the ability uh, to work together, to collaborate. You know, I, I, you know, I grew up and, and, you know, Tip O'Neill said that politics is the art of the possible. Well, it no longer is. When you see the person on the other side of the aisle as non-human, as, 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 as however you want to pigeonhole them and characterize them as less than you, as whatever, then you can't work together. And this is going to take, some, this is going to take us working together. You know, it's a real bad look that the governor of Texas is going to be speaking at, at the uh, NRA convention in, uh, in, in Houston. I think it's in Houston. It's a real bad look that they're having a convention 30 miles from where kids got killed. So, you know, we got to do something. We have to do something. And, and there are, I believe that there are the kinds of restrictions that we can put on the proliferation of weapons that don't impact uh, the, the perceived ability, which is it's not in the constitution, but there's this perception that people can own as many guns as they want. Um, that's a created right, uh, but, but um, we can do this. There are things that we can do. Bruce Menon, again, Newburyport School Committee here joining us. Um, you know, you got to be careful with how you phrase some of these things because, you know, you don't, you don't want to stoke up more fear. Parents are already seeing this on the news and, you know, it's already nerve wracking time. I'm sure it's, I can't imagine sending your kids off to school. I mean, it's probably different thoughts in the heads of parents this week, every day, and probably for many weeks going forward. But, um, but we mentioned the Ted Cruz comments earlier. I saw those comments as well. Uh, my first thought was exactly what you said. Well, that doesn't seem possible with fire codes and just logistics. Um, maybe just as an example, like that, let's just take Newburyport High School. I mean, there's going to be several different ways in. I, I try to picture the building myself, but I, I, that would never work, right? By law, there are so by statute, we need to have you need to have X number of exits um, in and out of the building by simply by law. That's not a good solution. Um, he suggested hardening schools, meaning having armed, you know, guards at schools. Well, that didn't help it. Uvalde, you know, didn't help at Parkland because there was an armed guard at Parkland. So that's not a good idea. Asking teachers in addition to teaching to be expert marksmen, um, you, had, you had cops there who didn't, didn't do what they could have done, both at Parkland and Uvalde. And I totally get that. I totally understand that. But that's not the answer. Those are really simplistic answers. None of those answers address the proliferation of weapons in the community. Those, you know, in, in fact, 
that's advocating for, well, the answer to this problem is to give everybody a gun. Well, I, I don't know that that's the answer. I think the answer is to, is to re remove from circulation the kind of weapons that can kill 19 kids with a squeeze of a finger. We don't need those weapons. They don't belong in a civil society. Okay. We talk about the, the kids so much. And I mean, obviously, you know, school is all, all about the kids. But and one other thing, we're not, we sure we're talking about them because two teachers heroically, uh, one of those teachers in that fourth grade classroom, as you said, was laying on top of students as they found clearly trying to protect those kids. Um, and we've seen, you know, the, the family members come out and say all she wanted to do was help kids and all that, like so many teachers do out there. Um, you know that I am married to a teacher. I, it, it, it creates a different thought when you, the teachers okay. head off to school, just like it does with the kids. I mean, there's already staff shortages all around the country. I guarantee you that doesn't help much when you're thinking about that could happen in my school. No, I, I you know, it's, it's interesting. I, I was reading a, an emergency room physician, an article about an emergency room physician who pointed out that in Uvalde, none of those kids made it to the hospital. None of them. They all died in the classroom because they were so badly shot up. On my driver's license, I have a little sticker that basically says, if I should die from gunfire, I want pictures. You have permission to show pictures of my body because you, you can't imagine. You know, I, I think that if if those if people understood what it's like to see a, you know, a, a first grade kid or a third grade kid blown to pieces by an assault weapon, I, I think we would act. It, it, it's horrific. It really is horrific. And that's why for me, that's my little effort to try to, 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 to have a realistic conversation about this. If I should die from gunfire, I want pictures of me spread everywhere so that you can see it. And there is, I mean, it's, it's not trying to become a gruesome part of the show, but let's face it, you know, 20 people just died of gunfire in a community. I mean, there's nothing more gruesome than that. And a lot of these military guys are teaching me stuff about these assault rifles just by talking that I never knew. I mean, I didn't realize that the, these things are designed to hit your body and then destroy after contact. You know, I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, so again, I think that that's, I think that's something that's realistic. I think that is something that we can, we can do and we should, we should there, you know, there's there, it would be very interesting to sort of catalog a lot of these shootings where they're taking place and see if they correlate with open carry or, or see if they correlate with laws that allow, that don't have waiting periods. Um, I, I suspect that there is a correlation. Um, you know, we don't, I mean, it, it, in those States where, where, where uh, owning a gun is encouraged and there are very few, um, there, there are very few restrictions on who can own a gun or how they can get them. I, I think that it's, it's like a free for all. My, um, my, my sources, and as you know, I know many people within the Newburyport schools, they were telling me that there were school-wide announcements yesterday. I'm not sure maybe you right. can speak to those or, you know, yeah. whatever you can or cannot say, um, but uh, and maybe tell us what those were a little bit, but I'm also curious how do you, and maybe you don't, maybe you leave it to the teachers to find the best way to do it. Do you guys help the, I mean, do teachers help teachers? Does the school committee yes. help teachers on how to address yes. this with kids? Um, one of the things that um, before the day was out, um, the superintendent Gallagher um, sent an email around to all parents of kids, you know, explaining that, that this is really a tragedy, again, another tragedy, and that um, supports are available in the school for teachers and students. You know, we sort of ramp up a little bit in these kinds of situations where we have staff, because over the last few years, we've been focusing really on the emotional and social well being of kids. We have staff who are trained, we have people coming in from the outside who are available to answer questions, to help kids work through some of this stuff, to help teachers work through some of this stuff. You know, it, and, and when I started on the school committee 20 years ago, it was it would been have been on my imagination that we would have needed to have access to experts to talk to our kids and talk to our staff when this happens. And now it happens three or four times a year. Mm -hmm. And each time, you know, we're as prepared as we can be. And again, that whole social emotional learning thing, we're trying to identify kids who, who really are struggling, who are being bullied, who, who are um, at risk for this. You know, you, you, I mean, you hear about it for each of these kids, even this kid in Texas was bullied 
mm-hmm. by people around him. So, you know, we, we try to try to address that. And, and, and in effect, over these 20 years, schools, I think, have taken on an increasing role in the emotional health and well-being of, of students and the community. We've had to address things like, um, you know, making, making, it, uh, making our space available for therapists to see kids. Um, you know, if, they, if, they, if their parents have a hard time getting them to a therapy appointment or they need it, we'll work with them. You know, and, and again, more and more work on having to address these large, large, large existential issues. With and kids, you know, with that's, that is one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on here today in the aftermath of this, because, and this may be where we venture into the territory of you maybe not specifically speaking for the school committee, but I've always admired your ability to kind of look at schooling differently. Let's, let's look at it as a, maybe it doesn't have to be the same way it was 10, 20, 30 years ago. Maybe we need to try different ways of learning, whether that be, you know, whether it's stargazers, we go outside at night as a class, but, you know, actually look at the stars. I remember that being like, well, yeah, I never would have thought of that. Um, and I imagine when it comes to this area, you know, mental health or dealing with crises like this, I imagine you have those kind of similar thoughts on this. Maybe a different approach needs to be taken in the classroom. Yeah, I think that, you know, we have, um, for example, um, we have m- most of the middle school staff, I think, are now trained in trauma sensitive classrooms. So, you know, kids experience trauma, whether that's the trauma of going without breakfast five days a week because the parents don't have enough money for breakfast or they've seen abuse situations or, or drug addiction in their families, whatever, whatever that, that is, we now have a whole body of teachers and we're, we have teachers training teachers in how to be aware of that stuff in students, how to respond to that stuff in students, and how to, how to make linkages to resources for students and families. And, and more and more, we're starting, to have to, we're starting to have to do that because that's, what, that's, what it's, that's what's going to help our kids be the most successful that they can possibly be. Hmm. Again, Bruce Menon joining us. Uh, Bruce, I will c- kind of come to the end here. I do want to, you know, I had a Columbine was 12 year old Drew. 10 years ago for me, it was just Sandy Hook. And I remember thinking during Sandy Hook, because that felt close to home being New England, I remember thinking, I can't believe this has all just happened since Columbine. You know, I remember Columbine well. That happened at a very impressionable point in my life. Um, I'm sure there's kids right now that are, will never ever forget, forget this moment. I won't, but I mean, for think about that. If you're growing up and you're around that age group, I mean, that stays with you until the day you die, whether you live. 10 miles or 10 hundred miles away. Um, imagine, imagine the impact of being in that school oh. at time, you know? So, so it's not just, it's not just the tragedy of the loss of life that that's horrific, but the, the lifelong impact that it has on the collateral damage, literally among students and staff. No doubt. And I, I just wonder from your perspective, you, I mean, like I said, Columbine is stitched in my memory forever. I remember seeing uh, as a kid that was years away from high school, I remember seeing high school kids, you know, running and crying outside and uh, I'll never forget those images. Um, as somebody who has seen all of this uh, and being in the schools, working in the, for the school committee, I just, what did days like that do to you in that industry, in that line of work? I mean, it just must be gut wrenching. Well, yeah, I mean, it is, it is really gut wrenching, you know, it's gut wrenching for our staff. Um, you know, we're sort of at the place now where if we're not, if we're not willing to take some of the harder decisions that are going to prevent these things from happening, then we damn well better be prepared to deal with them when they happen and the fallout of afterwards. That doesn't solve the problem. That just helps um, people heal in the environment, but it doesn't solve the problem. Um, and that's, that is the frustrating piece that there are very simple things that we can do that are not really invasive um, to my point of view. And you know, when it really comes down to it, we, we are killing kids, we're killing kids and, and we're allowing that to happen. And it doesn't happen in other places. You know, it just, it simply doesn't happen in other places. And there's a reason for that. And we need to look long and hard at why that is going on. We need to have the conversation. It's not, it's not either or. There's a lot of gray here. And we are, we are in a highly polarized time politically. So, so people only want to see the black and white of it. And it isn't black and white. So I, I'm hopeful 
You know, I, I, I see how strong our, our kids are. I see them addressing issues, learning how to, how, how to talk with adults, learning how to collaborate with each other. And that is very, very encouraging for me. But, you know, I also know how, how hard it, this is for those kids, for all of us, parents. And, I, you know, my kids are both out of school now. Um, but just the horror of this, some, something like this happening, the lockdowns, the drills, this, that will list, you know, ducking and covering, going down to the basement of my school and putting my head between my legs because it could be a bomb that explodes. Um, that stayed with me my entire life. And that, that, was, that is a lens through which I see uh, the world mm. and it could go like that and that, that we've got to do something. We can act. Uh, Bruce, Lynn, we appreciate the time as always. I'll let you take us out of here in just a moment. I just want to say on behalf of uh, the whole JAPA afternoon crew, our thoughts are with the people of Uvalde, Texas, and uh, with this nation as we deal with a, a horrible, horrible problem, a horrible week. Um, and I know it's been a, a strange time for school kids having to get out of bed and saddle back up and go in the classroom. And um, I, I, sometimes, sometimes people don't think of the fear of that. Uh, because it is, you know, here we are in Massachusetts, we're far away from it, but man, does that hit close to home when something like that happens in this country. Uh, Bruce, man, I'll let you end with this. Why don't you just, um, I'm sure there's plenty of parents in Newburyport this week that uh, have woken up saying, do I really want to send my little boy or girl to school this week? Uh, what would you say to them, uh, parents having that fear? Well, what I would say to them is that um, school, we, we have worked very, very hard the district, the staff, the school committee, the entire community has worked very hard to try to make schools a safe place, a safe place where, where kids, not only their their day-to-day -day safety, but a safe place where kids can experience the things they experience and, and talk about those things um, and get support. And we that is going to be, that's, we're never going to accomplish that fully. We're always going to have to be working at that. But um, I think, you know, we, we've seen how the staff, uh, in schools were able to somehow over the past two years during a pandemic teach continue to teach kids. I think we know that the staff are really dedicated here and and if, you know as a parent myself, um, in some ways, the idea of sending the kids to school is, is a really good idea because there are people who are sensitive to what's going on and aware uh, and helping kids process stuff I, you know, I mean, if we, if we are too afraid to send our kids to school, then we are way beyond what's possible to change. And I don't think we're at that point yet. I really don't. Well said. Uh, you know, I had a bunch of other things that I was going to touch with you on this show, but uh, it just doesn't really feel right as this thing went on. And uh, obviously this is uh, kind of front and center and this is the major issue of the day. So we'll tackle those other issues some other day. But Bruce Menon, I always appreciate the time. Thank you, sir. No, thank, no problem. Thank you very much. And I appreciate it as well. Bye-bye. Bruce Menon, Newburyport School Committee. Always appreciate the time. Drew Mulholland, live at Drew's house. Sarah Blackstone producing, as always, back in the studio in Newburyport. Thank you, Sarah. I'll be back next week. I promise another edition, live at Drew's house, Jump Afternoon Drive. Peace.